here this morning. If you have a Bible, if you want to turn with me to John chapter 1, John chapter 1, and we'll get there in a moment. I know uh, Roxy just prayed for us, but I want to let's have a time of prayer uh, just for all that's going on in our world. Um, I mean, what a time that we live in. Well, we don't have to wait for documentaries to come out about conflict around the world, but we can see things from people's cell phones. So it's pretty, pretty crazy. And so um, I, if you're new to our church, my name's Chuck. I'm one of the pastors here. Thanks for being here today. Um, we're, I, I don't really care where you fall politically. I, I don't think um, that really matters. But when people are seeing things like happen where there's war and violence, we should stop and pray, especially for what's happening in the Ukraine. And um, especially, I don't know if you've gotten to see, but I would Google Christians in the Ukraine because lots of amazing stuff's happening with the church there, with what Christians are doing, uh, from gathering and just praying and worshiping like in fields, streets, uh, subways, and just amazing stories of what's happening there. But we just want to stop and pray um, just for God to have mercy um, on that nation. And so um, would you pray with me about that? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We open your word, your scripture. What we find is one of the fruit of the Spirit, the title of Jesus. Even, Father, you are called the God of peace, the Prince of peace. The fruit of the Spirit is peace. And Lord, that's not just our, our peace with you through Jesus, but that is one day the peace that will flood the world. At the return of Jesus, at the coming, the full coming of your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And Father, we pray for um, that you would bring that peace right now to our planet, that you would give us um, a foretaste of that. Lord, we pray especially for the citizens, the civilians, the soldiers, for all the people involved in the conflict in the Ukraine. We pray that you would protect the people there. We pray you would bring an end to this violence. We pray that you would protect the people there. Lord, we pray for conviction on uh, leadership to seek peace and prioritize human life. Lord, we pray for uh, the Christians there, Lord, as they... God, are, are seeking you and, and seem to be resolved to, to be faithful to you. To um, Lord, we just pray you would strengthen them. They would be able to, in the midst of this horrible time for them, be able to point people to Jesus. Yeah. And that, Lord, you might even bring somehow through all this mess an awakening to that <clears throat> land that would just be a light to the world. And so Jesus... Let your kingdom come. Bring peace to this place. And Father, help us not just be cold and indifferent. Help us not just write things off and blame a politician we don't like, no matter whatever side we're on. But help us remember these are real people, real men, real women, real children. Help us remember that as the body of Christ, and Lord, we... We can do a lot, but one of the most important things we do is we can stop and ask for you to stretch out your hand and do what no one on the planet can do. So we do that today. And now as we read your word, as we come before you, we open our hearts and say, speak to us. Holy Spirit, guide us into all truth now. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, about once a year, I'll read a biography. I don't really read a lot of biographies, uh, but about once a year, I'll read one. I usually read a biography about somebody that I really, their life I admire, and I'm like, man, I want to know this person more. I want to know like what makes them tick, their way of life. And so, you know, like I read a biography on Teddy Roosevelt before he became the president. Uh, uh, one of the best biographies I read over the last year or so is a, a book called Reese Howell Intercessor. And Reese Howell lived a long time ago in a different country, and um, he was a prayer warrior. He was a missionary. 
Mary, just just really inspiring, inspiring story. Very convicting about his obedience to the Lord. And then, so there's biographies you read about people that are like, man, they got it right in, in some areas. They weren't perfect. And like God reads how he wasn't perfect, but but they got some things right. And then there's biographies you read because, man, that guy was a train wreck. That guy was a disaster. I want to read about it so I don't do that, you know, or it's like the train wreck you can't turn away from. And, you know, and, and some people read those books. I, I don't read those books because I feel like, why would I read about a train wreck when I am a train wreck? I don't want to, you know, read any more about that and pour any fuel on that fire. I want to read, you know, really about people that, that get at least get it right in some area, even though they're not perfect. And today we're going to look at, in the Gospel of John, a character that John the Apostle is going to point to that's not perfect, but he gets it right in, in, in many different ways, particularly in an area that we're going to talk about today. Because today we're going to read about John the Baptist, which can be a little confusing because we're reading from the Gospel of John the Apostle about John the Baptist. And so if you're new to the Bible, these are two different people. It could be a little confusing, but um, you know, I'll try to make sure I'm talking about the Baptist or the Apostle. And remember, and he's John the Baptist. Let's just get this out of the way for some of us new to the Bible. He's not the Southern Baptist, okay? He didn't start the Southern Baptist Church, okay? That's a whole nother story at another time because just he was John the Baptizer. And we'll talk about more about what he does that in a minute, uh, why he does that in a minute. But the thing about John the Baptist is he probably got the highest... Um, like the best thing that could be said about a person was said about John the Baptist, and Jesus said it. Jesus said this in Luke chapter 7, verse 28. He says, I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John. I mean, if Jesus is saying that, then it's like, we should probably read about him. Okay, And we don't have a full biography of him, but we have little snippets of his life that we can see. All four gospel writers mention John the Baptist in some form or fashion. Luke tells us about his birth. Uh, Luke tells us his uh, dad was Zechariah, his mom was Elizabeth. Zechariah was a priest. Uh, Zechariah has an encounter with the angel Gabriel as he's uh, going into the Holy of Holies in the temple and says they're going to have this child. They're they're elderly. They're way past childbearing years. And uh, and Elizabeth is the cousin to Mary, the mother of Jesus. And uh, all this things happen, but John from his, like, even like then when he's told, you know, Zechariah's going to be told they're going to have this baby, he has a specific purpose and a specific thing he's supposed to do. And as John the Baptist becomes, you know, an adult, he's, he begins to preach. He begins to tell people to repent, to turn back to God. He, he's calling out religious leaders, local government hypocrisy. He was kind of an oddball. He like lived out in the woods, in the wilderness. He wore a camel, you know, clothing made out of camel hair. He ate locusts, you know, so I don't know. I don't, I don't know if that was like gluten-free thing, or if he was vegan. I don't know how that works uh, with all that. But he had a very odd diet, okay? Let's just say say that. And um, eventually, he'll baptize Jesus. And that'll be mentioned in this story. It's The story is talked about in Luke and Matthew, but John just refers to the story. And so... Even Roman soldiers were coming up to him and repenting and saying, what can we do? And, and they were getting baptized. It's a bit, really big deal. So as we pick up the story, in fact, already as we studied John a couple of weeks ago, it was out last week, so we took a break from John. But when we studied the first part of John 1 two weeks ago, uh, John the Apostle's already been mentioning John the Baptist. He mentioned him over in verse 6 where he said, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. And so in the first part, the first eight verses, John the Apostle drops these little lines here and there about John the Baptist getting prepared for us to meet him and encounter him. And so we pick it up in verse 19. uh, These religious leaders have come to John the Baptist to ask him about what's going on because he has so many people coming to him. So many people are are getting baptized. All these things are happening. He's creating a little uproar and they want to investigate. So we pick it up in verse 19. And this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. And what we're going to see from John today, what we can learn from him, one of the things, not not everything he got right, but one of the things John got right is John lived out of a healthy identity. He lived out of a healthy identity. And a healthy identity, we're going to see from John, really involves two big ideas. And the first is, I need to know who I am not. To have a healthy identity, I need to know who I am not. John, you know, I mean, he's got all these people following him. Uh, We'll read in a couple of weeks about what happens when people stop following him and how he uh, handles that. But he has all these people coming to him, wanting to learn from him, getting baptized, listening to his teaching. I mean... 
And we've seen, you've probably seen in your lifetime, and maybe you know people, that success and fame can go to a person's head and go to a person's ego. And they start thinking they're really great. So these Jewish leaders uh, send all these religious leaders to him, and they're basically like, well, are you the Christ? Are you the Messiah? I am not. Are you Elijah? Why would they think he's the prophet Elijah? Well, uh, the, the prophet Malachi said that um, Elijah would come before the Messiah. And John the Baptist, you know, as you kind of study him, he's, he kind of reminded people of Elijah. Elijah also dressed weirdly and ate weirdly and lived out in the wilderness and was kind of this fiery prophet. But, but the prophets didn't mean like the actual literal Elijah was coming, but one who is coming kind of in the spirit of kind of the same vein of. And he's like, well, no, I'm not that person. I'm not... I, I'm not Elijah reincarnated because that's what some people thought it was, even though he was a type of Elijah. He wasn't what they meant when they said Elijah. And then this thing, are you the prophet? And the prophet refers to a passage in the book of Deuteronomy about this figure that's going to come and do some of the things to lead Israel like Moses did. And some thought, well, this is like another figure that maybe he'll be like an assistant to the Messiah, while many just thought he it was the Messiah. And most scholars think that this prophet that Moses referred to is the Messiah. So again, he's saying, no, I'm not. He knows who he's not. That's very, very important. But when I was thinking about this and knowing who I'm not, you know, the, the thing we probably could all relate to is we know certain things we're not good at. You know if you're not an athlete, okay? You know, you're the kind of person that maybe, you know, dribbles a basketball off one time and then you can't find it, you know, because it bounced away. You know, I can relate to that. Or the best example of knowing who you're not or people that need to know who they're not was way back in the day. I haven't watched this show in years, okay? But I think it's still on. American Idol's still on, right? Yeah, it's still on. But way back in the day, so I don't know how it is now, but way back when it was first popular and all that, you know, they, my favorite shows were the first auditions. You know, after the good people start singing, I kind of lost interest because like normal people, they start putting makeup on. But I love it when the normal people would come. There'd be the long lines at the convention centers and there'd be these guys and these gals that would come in there and there's Simon Cowell and the other people were sitting up there and they'd and, and these people get up there and they just sound terrible. And they'd have, and they tell their story. Like they're setting up. They're outside, you know, I've been dreaming about being a singer forever, and I'm here for mama today, and mama said I was a great singer, and then you, they get up there, and they sing, and it's just like a frog croaking, you know, and you're, and you're just like, mama lied, man. Your mama's a liar, you know? And you hate to say that about somebody's mama, but that's true, you know? I mean, just, and then like, you know, they stop on the stop, 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 you know, and you can just Simon Cowell just rip them to shreds, and, and you're like, that's so harsh, but so true, you know, man, tell love, you know, because those people did not, they thought they were, and they leave going, I'm still living for my dream, man. I'm still following my passion. I don't care what they say, you know. You're like, do you care what America says? Everybody's at home going, oh, make it stop, you know. These people didn't know that they weren't singers. Now, obviously, we get that. Some of you know you're not a singer. Some of you know, well, I'm a singer, but I'm a shower singer, whatever. You know, keep that to yourself. <laughs> but here's what we do. We attach our identity to the things that we do and the possessions that we have. You are not your stuff. You're not your job. We have roles and giftings, but that's not the core of our identity. I have a role as a husband, but if I wasn't married, I'd still have to have a healthy identity. That can't be what my identity is built on. I have a role as a dad, but if I didn't have children, I can't, you know, I still ha have to have a healthy identity. I can't build my identity on my kids and on my marriage. You know, I'm a pastor, but I can't build my identity because I won't always be a pastor. I have to build my identity on something else. If I build my identity on things that can't bear the weight of my soul, I'll find that I'm always living kind of this kind of unstable life, an unstable soul. If you try to build your identity on only what you can achieve, what will you do when you can't achieve those things anymore? If you build your identity only on your relationships, what will you do when you don't have those relationships? Because just friendly reminder, every relationship you have could come to an end. What will you do? If you try to build your identity on your possessions, what will you do when you don't have them? You have to know, I am not these things. Well, then if we know who we're not, a healthy identity, of course, would be, well, we have to know who we are. But if you're a follower of Jesus, it goes even further than that. That a healthy identity is built on knowing who I am not, 
but it's also built on knowing who I am, but in Christ. In Christ. And so in verse 22, we see, So they said to him, Who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Make straight the way of the Lord. As the prophet Isaiah said, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. He knew exactly who he was. And a couple of things we see about how he describes himself here and as we go further on in the passage. When he knows who he is in Christ, number one, that's, he's grounded in Scripture. Notice he quotes Isaiah. His identity isn't just like, well, I'm this and this, and this is how, who I feel, and these are my dreams, these are my passions. No, I'm going to quote Scripture here. I'm going to tell you what the Bible says about who I am. And to have a healthy identity, I believe that you have to find something outside of yourself. And it's my conviction that the thing outside yourself that you can ground your identity in, you'll find no other sure foundation other than the Scriptures. Because the Scriptures will tell you so many things about yourself. It will at least tell you these two things. Number one, you are living right now in the middle of a story that's not about you. You are living in the middle of God's story. 1977, I'm six years old. My, two things happened that year that was really, really important. My brother was born. That was one thing. The most important thing, just kidding, Chris, if you're watching, um, was Star Wars came out. The original Star Wars. And I saw the movie theater back in the time where like people, you know, there's no, there's no Netflix, none of this nonsense, okay? Where you can just like watch anything on demand or now it's like, it's in the theater, but I can also pay $14.99 and watch it at home. Like, We've lost society, okay? But back in, the, and back in the day, you actually had to go, stand in line, pay money. You know, you, didn't, you hadn't already seen like 20 million previews that waste all the good parts of the movie. So you just go in there. And I mean, I'm six years old. I'm watching this thing. And it comes on. Of course, you remember, you know, it gets the, the 20th Century Fox thing that comes on. I mean, that 20th century, I mean, that really dates it. 20th Century and, fi- and that, it's gone. But it comes on. And then it says, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. And it's very quiet. And then the John Williams score happens. And it's big. And I thought about playing it for you, but then I was just like, you know, Jason used some last, I'm not doing that. You know, let him have the film clip. But, um, and then it starts, it has the screen crawl. And if you remember, something happens in the screen crawl, which kind of could disorient you, especially if you're a linear thinker that likes things in sequential order. So for the nerds in the room, what's the thing you see first? Come on. Episode four. Episode four. Thank you. Thank you. Real Christian over here. Uh, my brother. I'm surprised at some of you. Looking at you, Jeff. Uh, yeah, what happened, Dave? Episode four. That's right. Episode four. Not one, two, or three. It starts at episode four. And in your episode four, what happened to one, two, three? Did I miss something coming in? Yeah, you missed a lot. I mean, actually, it wasn't that great what you missed. Well, you thought that's a whole other conversation. But, um, and so, thank you. <laughs> See, revival's coming, guys. Uh, and so it starts episode four, and it's rolling up, and, it, and in the whole movie doesn't care. It doesn't care you don't know what's going on. It doesn't care what you think about one, two, and three. It doesn't care about anything. It cares about sit down, shut up. You're in our story now. And it rolls up a few lines, and you're just like, okay, there's a princess, there's plans, whatever. And now these are ships shooting each other. There's these weird robots. There's these plans. There's Obi-Wan Kenobi, who's my only hope. It's like, what kind of name is that? It doesn't care. It's like you're in the middle of our world now. And here's the thing. When our identities are grounded in Scripture, you woke up today. In a world that's like, well, yeah, there's, there's, you know, there's COVID and there's the Ukraine, there's the economy, and there's all this kind of stuff like that. And the, the story going on, that's all just minor details. Because the story you woke up to today is there was a God in heaven who created everything out of nothing. He created male and women in his image, men and women in his image, and, and he created them for, for intimacy with him and created for relationship with him. But due to a cosmic rebellion, where an angelic being rebelled from God, rejected God, came to earth, tempted and deceived humanity, so they rebelled and rejected God. The whole world has been broken, fractured, fallen, everything wrong with the world. Pretty much everything in the news right now stems from that moment. It's not like we just invented war, or, well, the Ukraine conflict, it started. No, it goes all the way back to Genesis 3. Disease and death, all the way back to Genesis 3. 
that this God in heaven began a plan, a rescue plan that ultimately comes in the sending of Jesus who comes to live, to die, to rise again, to pay for sin, to pay for the cosmic trees and humanity is committed. And this Jesus has ascended into heaven. He has sent his Holy Spirit. He has commissioned his people to be his body, his temple, his family in the world to make him known to be the lie of the world. And one day, he will return to set up his eternal kingdom. This is a story you woke up finding yourselves in. And this story is like, you listen, paying the bills, raising the kids, you know, fixing whatever is broken in your house. That's all great. It has great meaning and significance. But know this, you are not the point. You are valuable and valued and loved. But we are in the midst of a bigger story. And that should awaken us to go, okay, if I'm in the middle of God's story, then why does God have me here? Second thing about being grounded in Scripture, then I realized that I was made by God, and I was made for God. We talked about this over the fall, if you were here for our series, Made for This. If not, you can go back and listen to it. We just talked about what is our purpose in life. But I was made by God and for God. When our identity is grounded in Scripture, it answers a lot of questions. Genesis tells us we were made male and female in his image. That's the issue that seems to be all around, except when I guess war breaks out, that's always crowding the headlines. Being male and female. But the scripture answers that. And yeah, a lot of things are broken. A lot of things are jacked up and fractured and not right for how it was created in the beginning. But our identity can be found in the pages of Scripture. I'm made in His image, which means I'm His representative. I have this dignity as an image bearer of God. Men don't have it solely, and women don't have it solely. But men and women together, we reflect the image of God in a way that, that, we, we, in a way that God has designed for us to, like no other creature He created. The Psalms tell us we were knit in our mother's womb, that we were fearfully and wonderfully made. Colossians says that we, that phrase, I was made by God and for God, that comes from the book of Colossians itself. I was made for him and by him. I'm not an accident. I'm here on purpose. That I have value, I have dignity as an image bearer of God. When your identity is grounded in scripture, so much we could say, we at least say those two things. You're in the middle of a story, God's story. What's your part in that? Because you were made by him and you were made for him. Your life is bigger than you. The second thing about knowing who I am in Christ is I've got to be grounded in scripture, but I have to then focus on Christ. My identity has got to be focused on Christ. And notice again in verse 23, John's focus was on Jesus. I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. Skip down to verse 25. They asked him, then why are you baptizing? If you're neither the Christ nor Elijah nor the prophet. John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know. Even he who comes after me, the straps of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. Now, when we talk about our identity being focused on Christ, there's a few, lots of things we could say about it. Just a few I'll say this morning from kind of taken from this passage. Number one, is we, if my identity is focused on Christ, and I have to have a high view of Christ. A high view of Christ. John has an amazing high view of Christ for all the different things he says. But one of his greatest little things that might just go away unnoticed if you're not paying attention is what he says in verse 27. That the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. Now, you probably know they, they wore sandals back then. It's, you know, the, there was feet washing when they would enter into a house. They'd take off their sandals. That's usually what, like, slaves and servants did. And so, the, I, and so you didn't touch your own strap of sandal. You know, that, it, it was like the low, and you definitely wouldn't do it for somebody. It's like the lowest thing you could do for someone. John says, for him, I'm not even worthy to do that. He's so high. He's so amazing. He's so wonderful and glorious. I'm not worthy. I mean, think about, think about the grossest thing you could do 
to help someone in terms of just like dirt and filth on them or something, you know, you know, you know maybe you know, helping someone go to the restaurant. I don't know what that would be. Whatever that would be in your mind is like, yeah, that's pretty gross. It's pretty disgusting. John's like, I'm not even worthy to do, help them with that because he's so amazing. He has a high view of Christ. You can't ground your identity in something you don't have a high view of. We have to have this high view of Christ. Number two, we have to have a high, see our high need of Christ. In verse 28, it says, These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day, he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. Behold. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, to my knowledge, John the Baptist is the first person to call Jesus that and is the only person in the Gospels to call him that. From what I can tell, I could be wrong, but I can't find anyone else that says that except John the Baptist. And John the Apostle, that's one of his main things to write about, is that Jesus is the Lamb of God. So when he says that, the Jews around him would have obviously kind of perked up. Because he's pointing to something, and scholars debate, well, what exactly was he pointing? Is he pointing to one specific thing about being the Lamb of God, or is he pointing to all of them? Because what could he be pointing to? Well, he could be pointing back to Abraham. And Abraham was God's uh, chosen one that who, through his line, through his people, he was going to create this nation out of him. And that nation was going to bring a blessing to the world. And Jesus was from the line of Abraham. And so there's this story in Genesis 22. And Abraham finally has a legitimate son with his wife, Sarah. Isaac, God tells him to go offer Isaac as a sacrifice. And so they go up to this mountain and they're going up there. And what are we doing, Dad? We're going up here to worship. But where is the lamb? And there's this famous line, Genesis 22, God will provide a lamb. And they get up there to the altar and Abraham puts Isaac on the altar and has the knife in his hand in the air about to do the deed. And God says, stop. I realize now you love me more than anything. There's nothing you wouldn't withhold from me. And you're not going to do this. Don't harm the boy. And over caught in the brush is a lamb. God provided a lamb. Jesus is the lamb of God that God provides to die in our place for our sins. He could be referring to the Passover lamb in Exodus where God's rescuing his people from Egypt and, he, and he's been telling Pharaoh to let his people go and Pharaoh keeps going, no, no, no. So God keeps bringing plague after plague after plague and finally he's like, listen, if you won't let him go, I'm sending my angel of death and it's going to take the life of every firstborn child in Egypt. But God tells his people, if you will take a lamb and you'll kill a lamb and put the blood of the lamb over your doorpost, the angel of death will pass over you. And that happens. The angel of death comes and there's lots of tragedy in Egypt. But those who have the blood of the lamb on their door, he passes over. Jesus is the Passover lamb, which the wrath of God passes over our life when we believe in him. Then the Passover lamb gives way to the, the sacrificial lamb and the, and the sacrificial system where daily there was, twice a day, there were lambs sacrificed for sin. And then once a year, the day of atonement, remembering the Passover, there was the great uh, sacrifice in the day of atonement and the scapegoat where they would put uh, their hands on this goat and transfer the sins of Israel onto the scapegoat and then lead that goat out because he took away the sins of the world, took away the sins of Israel. Could be referring to that. Because Jesus is the scapegoat who takes away our sins. And then Isaiah in chapter 53, he says, The Messiah will be one like a lamb led to the slaughter. By his stripes we will be healed, and on him was laid the iniquities of us all. That the Messiah won't just be this conquering king, but he will actually be a slaughtered lamb. And Isaiah mentions things and refers to things, referring and pointing to the crucifixion. And just on a side note, Isaiah was written 300 years before the Persians invented crucifixion. And he's already pointing to it. So when John says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, maybe he's referring to all of it. Maybe he's just focusing on one. But he's definitely pointing out the fact we all need him. A healthy identity is always aware that you need Jesus to take away your sin. You need the Lamb of God that was killed in your place for your sin because left on your own, your good deeds don't make you right with God. Because even behind your good deeds are probably prideful intentions. 
Because it all goes down to our souls are fractured. Our souls are infected with sin. This tendency to live with our li- ourself at the center. So our identity has to be focused on our need for Jesus. I need him to be the Lamb of God who takes away my sin. And I need every day to be reminded his mercies are new every morning. That wasn't just a one-time prayer I prayed, oh Jesus, forgive me, but every day his forgiveness is applied to me. And that what was broken from my, our original design of being made by God and for God, and because of sin is broken, is now being restored, being changed, and one day will be whole when Jesus returns. A healthy identity has a high need of Jesus. A high need to, just in, to be reminded of who He is, to encounter Him, to live a life immersed in His Spirit. Because look what happens next. In verse 31, he says, John the Baptist continues talking, I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and bore witness that this is the Son of God. Now, so many things happening here. So John's baptized, he baptizes Jesus. And notice he says, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove. Now, you may have seen, especially if you've been a Christian for a while, you've probably seen Jesus shows, you know, whether it's old movies or uh, the new one that shows. I don't know if this scene's been on there yet. I haven't watched all of them yet. But usually there's many Jesus programs, plays at churches, paintings, you know, old paintings, new paintings. There's usually some painting or scene of Jesus being baptized. And if you watch it, many times they'll baptize him. They'll show like some you know, sunlight coming down and they'll actually show a dove. But if you notice what John says, he says that the spirit descended from heaven like a dove. Not as a dove. And John is using language that the original Jewish audience would have gone, they would have been kind of amazed at. Because one, a dove, you know, when I think about a dove, I don't think much of it. I think of soap or chocolate or a harmless bird, okay? I'm a very shallow man. For the Hebrews, they would have gone back to Genesis 1, where the Spirit of God hovered over the water like a dove. It doesn't say that in our English, but many of the, com- the Hebrew commentaries about Genesis 1 talk about how he brooded there like a dove. Because the idea of a dove is the idea of God calming and bringing peace over the waters of his wrath. We get the peace, we get peace, the peace of God through Jesus. And notice that, you know, he talks about Jesus again. Jesus is the one that the Spirit descends on and remains. Because in the Old Testament, you have prophets and these figures that the Spirit would come upon but then when leave, it's like they get powered up, you know, like a guy like Samson, all of a sudden the spirit would come upon him and he'd have all this strength and he could be all these people, but then the spirit, you know, or the spirit would come upon these people or the spirit would come upon this. But for Jesus, the spirit descended on and remained. And then it says, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Now, if you've been around the church world, that phrase baptizes with the Holy Spirit probably can make some of you nervous or some of you really excited. But you need to know what the phrase just actually means here in the context of what John is writing about. Here's what it means. Jesus is the one who immerses your life in God's empowering presence. He is the one who engulfs you in the presence of God. Because that's what baptiz- the word baptize means. It means immerse. It's not a spiritual word. It's just a word that means immerse in the Greek. He just immerses people in God's empowering presence. I have a high need of Jesus every day to be reminded that he's the lamb that takes away my sin. And I have a high need every day to be reminded that my life because of him has peace with God and is immersed in his presence. 
this story that I find myself in, my purpose of being made by him and for him with a high view of him, I am also with him. That he is in me and around me. His presence is here. And so we have a high, need, high view of Christ, high need of Christ. And then the, the last thing we see about being grounded in Christ is a high purpose for Christ. A high purpose for Christ. Because here's the thing, a lot of Christians, they'll stop with, they're like, yeah, yeah, I am who Scripture says I am. I, I have a really high view of Christ. I know I have a high need of Christ. But they stop there. And so we live stunted lives and we're still unsure of our identity and we still chase after all the wrong things because we forget about the high purpose we have. The high purpose we have that's brought into every role. It's brought into your role as spouse. It's brought into your role as parent. It's brought into your role as coworker. It's brought into your role as teacher. It's brought whatever role you have. The high purpose for Christ is in all of that. It refers back to why you're in this story, why he's made you, why he has you here. Yes, friendship with him, fellowship with him, relationship with him, but you have a purpose. Notice that as John talks about his identity, it's grounded in scripture, focused on Christ, and part of his focus is his purpose for Christ. Christ. Again, verse 23, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. Now make no mistake, you are not the one coming in the spirit of Elijah. Isaiah wasn't writing about you and he wasn't writing about me. But John the Baptist is a great example for all Christians of what it means to live for the purpose of Christ. Because Jesus At the end of his three years of ministry, he'll say things like, go and preach, go and proclaim, make disciples, followers of every tribe, tongue, and nation. As the Father sent me, I'm sending you. Go and be my witnesses. Wait for the Holy Spirit to give you power, then you'll be my witnesses. He'll say this all over the New Testament, that this high purpose for Christ, maybe we're we're not the voice from Isaiah, but we, his people, We are a voice. We're his voice. We're his body, his hands and feet. We're the one that make Christ known. How do we make Christ known? Well, this passage really reminds us of really two things, and then we're done. We make Christ known, all of us, by going public with our faith. How can you talk about John the Baptist without talking about baptism? We go public with our faith in baptism. John was baptizing people through immersion. The reason this was such a big deal is the only people you baptized really with immersion was when Gentiles were converting to the Jewish faith. There were Hebrew cleansing rituals, but that's not what John was doing. And John was baptizing Jews. This is one of the reasons why they were so puzzled and they came out to go, what are you doing? Who are you? What is this about? Because if he was immersing people, that was a sign that you were entering into a new reality. So what new reality is he saying that these Jews are entering into? Well, John's reality is the reality of the coming of the Messiah. The Jews, the, the Jewish leaders are wondering, are you saying you're the Messiah and they're entering into your reality? Baptism is this sign that something has happened. Something's different about you. Christian baptism is the first act of obedience for Christians where we show outwardly what has happened inwardly. It is our public declaration that Christ has cleansed us And we are dying to our old way of life that's buried under the water. And we're rising to live a new life in Christ. We're not saying we're going to be perfect. We're just saying he's cleansed us and transformed us. Have you ever been baptized? Have you ever gone public with your faith? This is part of your purpose to make Christ known. It's part of your identity. This isn't being baptized as an infant. That's something your parents did to bless you. And that's wonderful. This is something you do to go public with your faith. If you have been baptized, do you ever think about that? It was a marker for me on my journey with Christ. For some of you, it's a marker to remember and celebrate. For some of you, it's your next step. And that Connect card Ryan mentioned earlier, you need to grab the physical copy of it. You need to text the the, the CB Connect to 97000, and you check in the box to get baptized. We're going to do baptism on Easter Sunday. What a great day to get baptized. The day we celebrate Jesus rising from the dead is showing that he raised you from spiritual death. You should get baptized then because you know Christ and you want to proclaim him. And then the second way we proclaim him is we point people to him. I mean, John the Baptist just keeps talking about Jesus. 
Notice he never really stops to talk really about himself. He's like, well, I'm, I'm baptizing. But there's this one that's coming. I'm not worthy to untie his strings. Oh, look, behold the Lamb of God. And I didn't even know him. I had to have God tell me that the one you do this is who the Holy Spirit comes on. I bear witness. He's the Son of God. He just keeps pointing and pointing to Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God. I mean, a great question to ask yourself and talk about in your community group is, what does your life telling people to behold? Behold my career. Behold my house. Behold this. Behold that. Behold my kids. Behold our family. A lot of times what we tell people to behold is usually what our identity is grounded in. And it's not wrong to thank God and praise God for your family and your job and talk about them as gifts and graces and you know, whatever they are, as long as you keep coming back to Christ. They're gifts from Him. It's God's mercy. It's God's kindness. It's God's purpose. I, you know, I get my paycheck from ABC, but, my, ABC, but my, my purpose is to point people to Christ, whether I'm working there, whether I'm a teacher, or an engineer, or a nurse, a doctor, whatever it is you are. My purpose is to point people to Christ, to help them become followers of Him and take their next step in following Him. And you do this by telling how Jesus told your story and, and you tell his story and, and, you, and you open your life up to other people. You pray for other people. You know, your occupation, your career, your craft may be whatever, but your purpose is to point people to Jesus at home, at work, at the park, at school, wherever you are. And you got to ask, am I living on purpose? How do I point people to Jesus? How am I doing with that? And, I know, and there's so much like, what if they ask me questions I don't understand or don't know the answer to? Then you don't know the answer to the question. It's pretty simple. You just say the phrase, I don't know. And then you say, but, but let's try to find out. Or I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that Jesus has changed my life. If you were here for the first song, no condemnation if you weren't, I understand. But we started nine, just, just saying. Um, <laughs> Just a little train, train. It's always a train. <laughs> Even when there's no train, there's a train. I'm just kidding. Um, um, but, um, but the first song, you stay, for the, you stay for the next service, let's do it. It has this line where it says, um, let my Jesus change your life. I may not know the answer to your question, but I know he's changed my life. And he can change your life too. So Easter's coming up, April 17th. We're going to do three services on Easter, just on that Sunday, to accommodate for people. I believe this year, more than ever, people need hope. I mean, it's tactile. It's in the air. I mean, there's a war. There's a pandemic. And there's you know, all these different things. They all, we always need hope. It's like, we only live right now, okay? I don't live like before. I only live right now. So right now, it just seems like, man, we could all do our part. I don't know how God wants to do your part personally. That's for you to pray and ask God to open doors and help me point people to Jesus today and all that. But together we can point people to Jesus. We can invite people. We can make sure everyone is served on that Sunday. And we'll talk more about it as we get closer. I know April may seem really far off to you, but it will be here before you know it. But we can just begin to pray right now. God, would you help me to point people to Christ this year? God, would you open a door for me and invite someone to church? Would you open a door for me and invite someone to Easter? God, do I need to go public with my faith on, and make Christ known to my family? Because you can invite all your family to come on Easter and watch you get baptized. And when I ask you the question, is this your public confession that Christ is your Savior, your Lord, and the treasure of your heart? You go, yes. And then I baptize you. Or, or, or maybe, you know, someone in your life that's real important, your community group leader, or someone, someone bat, puts you in that water, that is a sermon you get to preach. Your life has been changed by Jesus. Maybe that's how you got to point people to Jesus this year. I don't know. you got to ask the Lord about that. But your purpose is to make Christ known. So you got to know who you're not. You're not your stuff. You're not your occupation. You're not your spouse. You're not your kids. Those are great gifts but that can't be fundamental to who you are. Your identity has to be grounded in Scripture, in God's story, made by Him and for Him. And it's got to be focused on Jesus with a high view of Christ, a high need of Christ, and a high purpose for Christ. Not high purpose is to make Him known. Really, that should be like 3A, not 4, but whatever. Um, to make Christ known. So I don't know what your next step is, but what is your next step from hearing all this? Because you can't live your truest, healthiest identity, I believe, unless you're grounded in Scripture and focused on Christ. So let's pray.
So maybe just right now, you just need to confess, Lord, Lord, I, I think some of the anxiety I've been feeling in my heart is I've just been building my identity on the wrong things. You just need to confess that to him right now. And just thank him that he's the Lamb of God who takes away your sin. Ask him to cleanse you of that. Ask him to reorient your identity. Lord, help my sense of self be focused on who you say I am. What you call me to. The life I have with you. Maybe there was just one part of this where you were just like, yeah, I need to, I need to hone in on that. My high need of Jesus. I, I, I don't feel like I'm immersed in God's presence. Then ask the Lord, Lord, would you remind me that your presence is with me? Would you renew my understanding and awareness of your presence in my life? Maybe you just need to put your hands in your lap with your palms up, not for me, but for you, and just say, Lord, I just receive whatever help you want to give me right now to help my identity be grounded in you, grounded in Scripture, and focused on Christ. Holy Spirit, let your word now have its way in our hearts. Speak to us. Draw us close to you. Help the seed of your word go deep into our hearts. Let it not be snatched away. Let it not be choked out. But let it bear fruit. We thank you that that who we are is found not in achievements and all the stuff. Those are great gifts. But who we are is we're yours. And when we were separated from you, you did everything that it took to reconnect us to you through Jesus. Help us all now take whatever next step you're calling us to in being in Christ. We worship you now in Jesus' name. Would you stand with me? Let's sing this song as a song of response.